Welcome back. So we left off talking about cumulative selection, or we were about to start talking about cumulative selection, but I was mentioning this guy. This is Richard Dawkins. He is a very famous evolutionary biologist out of Oxford University, and he wrote this book called The Blind Watchmaker. And by the blind watchmaker, he's referring to natural selection as leading to the diversity of life on Earth, but there's no consciousness to how it works. So as we saw in the peppered moth story, the selecting force was the birds. Now the birds weren't consciously picking the most um, non-camouflaged moth and therefore affecting which uh, colored moth was represented in the population. They were just picking whatever they saw and that in turn caused evolution, caused changes in gene frequencies in the population over time and therefore that process of natural selection was blind. There was no consciousness to it. And as we said, organisms are not willing particular adaptations. They just do whatever works. Well, uh, Richard Dawkins wanted to address a, a critique that was out there that said, well, if you look at the structures in nature, if you look at organisms and organs, uh, they gave the example of the eye and the flagellum. If you look at these structures, they're so intricate and so complex they could not have possibly come about by random chance. That's the criticism against uh, natural selection as leading to the complexity and diversity of life on Earth. But we know that, in fact, natural selection is the opposite of random chance. It's the culling process. It's taking whatever adaptations happen to be in a variable population, and if those adaptations make that organism more successful for that particular environment, that organism is more likely to survive longer, reproduce more, have more offspring, and therefore pass their genes on, which will then be more represented uh, than the other genes in the population. So it's the opposite of randomness. The part of evolution that would be random would be mutations. You can have random mutations in the DNA or in chromosomes popping up, and even, uh, even not all those mutations are completely random, but that's for a higher level biology class. So for now, just know we can consider mutation random, natural selection the opposite of randomness. Well, anyway, Dawkins wanted to just give an illustration of, of natural selection, how it can, in fact, through its selective process, lead to great complexity over time. So he actually uh, created a computer program. It was, um, you know, this was back a while ago, so when computer programs were pretty simple, simplistic and, and slow. But he said, okay, let's take an illustration of a complex trait. And the complex trait he uh, chose was a line from Shakespeare's um, Hamlet. And the line is, methinks it is like a weasel. So again, this is from Hamlet. And he said, okay, let's pretend methinks it is like a weasel is a complex trait. Maybe it's a flagellum. Maybe it's an eyeball. Who knows what it is? Let's pretend that it's a complex trait. Now, let's say you gave a monkey a typewriter. If you gave a monkey a typewriter, and that typewriter only had 26 capital letters and a space bar on it, and given an infinite amount of time, could that monkey come up with something like, methinks it is like a weasel, just by pounding on the keys randomly? Uh, and the answer would be, well, yes, given an infinite amount of time, eventually, by chance, he would spit out, methinks it is like a weasel. But of course, life on Earth has only been around for three and a half billion years, not an infinite amount of time. So the argument is that, well, he could never spit out a complex trait like me thinks it is like a weasel in the length of time that life has been on Earth. So he said, okay, let's program the computer to represent this idea. Let's pretend the computer is the monkey typing on the typewriter. So uh, if you told the computer, okay, spit out 28 sentences just using random letters, would it ever come out to me thinks it is like a weasel? And the answer is no. In fact, um, like here's an example. Here is what it spit out on that first try. Really doesn't look anything like me thinks it is like a weasel. And the second try, nothing like me thinks it is like a weasel, et cetera, et cetera. And in fact, he calculated the odds of the computer just spitting out the correct sentence, me thinks it is like a weasel, just by chance. And the chance of that happening would be 10,000 million, 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 million to one that the correct answer would be spit out. In other words, it's not going to happen. So true, if selection was about just randomness, you would never get complex traits. You would never get organisms. You would never get the diversity of life on Earth. But again, that is not natural selection. That's not what natural selection does. 
So Dawkins said, let's change up the computer program. Let's make it more realistic of what actually happens under conditions of natural selection in nature. So he said, okay, we're going to change the rules. We're going to tell the computer to spit out 28 sentences. And they're all going to be the same sentence. So spit it out, 28 sentences, looks nothing like me, thinks it is like a weasel. That represents the first generation of offspring. But now you're going to tell the computer to take one of those sentences and insert a mutation. So either insert one letter or take a letter away or switch a letter with another letter. So that represents point mutations like we've talked about in nature, except we're just going to do it with the letters of the sentence that spits out. And so based on that, um, it's going to spit out 10 more sentences and whichever of those, you know, inserting a mutation each time and whichever of those 10 sentences looks a little bit more me thinks, like me thinks it is like a weasel, maybe two letters are in the correct sequence or whatever it is, whichever one looks the most in, in even the slightest way, it's going to take that sentence that looks the most like me thinks it is like a weasel, insert a mutation, um, 10 times. So it's going to spit out 10 more sentences, inserting a mutation or changing two letters in any way. And again, out of those, whichever one looks me th most like me thinks it is like a weasel, it's going to pick that one and replicate that one, inserting a mutation into each of those new sentences. And whichever one there looks the most like me thinks it is like a weasel, it'll, you know, use that one to spit out more uh, replicates except inserting a mutation each time. And so by doing this culling process where you're just choosing whichever one's a little bit more adapted to looking like me thinks it is like a weasel, very, very quickly you will get me thinks it is like a weasel. And in fact, it only takes 40 to 70 generations of the computer doing this to arrive at the sentence me thinks it is like a weasel. So this is an illustration of natural selection. Uh, nowadays, they actually have computer software programs because now we have faster computers, and it can spit out that sentence in less than 10 seconds. And uh, you can even search the web. You'll be able to find some of these programs you can play around with. And you can even put in any sentence you want, and it'll tell you how fast it'll take for it to get to that sentence doing this culling process. So this culling process that Dawkins uh, was illustrating where, you know, you're inserting one mutation, using that to replicate the next ones with mutations and whichever one from there, et cetera. Um, he called this cumulative selection, the idea that you're accumulating mutations over time due to them making an individual more uh, better adapted to that particular environment. Okay, so that's cumulative selection. It's just kind of a, you know, a quick and dirty way of illustrating how natural selection can lead to complex traits. Now, let's go over the other mechanisms of microevolution, which can lead to macroevolution. So we've talked about natural selection and artificial selection, cumulative selection being an illustration of those. <clears throat> but we said there's other mechanisms of evolution. So mutation, genetic drift, gene flow, and assortative mating. So we're going to talk about all of these. Now, you're already familiar with the mechanisms of mutation. We went over this when we were talking about protein synthesis. So I'm going to real quickly just review these. Um, you might remember that mutations are errors in the copying of DNA. So in other words, if this is your DNA molecule, you're inser inserting some kind of oops, and there are different kinds of mutations. So we talked about point mutations where you're getting um, one particular nitrogenous base, an A, C, T, or G, either uh, being deleted at what didn't get put in there where it should have been, or being inserted where it shouldn't have been, or switching, where you actually get a substitution mutation where one base becomes another base. So those are point mutations, and we also talked about chromosomal mutations. So we're going to review all of these. But recall that, really, evolution could not happen without ultimately getting mutation. It's these errors in the copying of DNA that cause us to have the raw material, the new material that then the other evolutionary processes can act on, such as natural selection. If we were all the same and everybody over the course of the history of, of life on Earth, three and a half billion years, had been made perfectly, life on Earth would never have any diversity. We'd all be genetically identical. So in most cases, um, mutations are what we call deleterious. They're, they have negative consequences for the organism um, because they uh, lead to the wrong protein or no protein made, um, and therefore, you know, it can cause genetic abnormalities, often results in miscarriage um, during embryonic development. So most of the time, it's bad for an organism. But as we saw when we studied protein synthesis, 
Often a mutation, especially if it happens in the third base of a codon, leads to still the same amino acid being produced and therefore it has a neutral effect on the organism. So even though they had the mutation, they still get the correct amino acid, they get the correct protein, they're okay. But where evolution comes into is when that mutation actually creates an altered protein so that they get a trait that causes their phenotype to be better adapted to that particular environment. And so in that case, that mutation is a beneficial mutation, a positive mutation. And that is what's going to ultimately help lead to evolutionary change in a population. Now, we said mutation is a very rare event. Um, the rate has been calculated. So for any one gene in any one um, sex cell, a gamete, each generation in eukaryotic organisms like us, the mutation rate is calculated to be negative or 10 to the negative fifth. So that's 0.00001 um, to 0.00001 um, per locus, so per gene location on DNA, um, per sex cell per generation. Okay, what does all that mean? In other words, mutation is a rare thing. It's very rare that any one gene, any given generation will have a mutation event. But it happens, and given three and a half billion years, which is a whole long time, um, it's guaranteed that any one particular gene has a high probability of experiencing a mutation event over evolutionary time. So quick review, again, uh, different ways we can get mutations. So imagine this is our original DNA sequence. You know, it could be whatever DNA sequence we wanted to stick there. And remember that every three DNA bases codes for three mRNA bases, which codes using the magic genetic code codes for a particular amino acid. So we have here, you know, CCG would be GGC for mRNA. And if you look up on the genetic code, that codes for glycine, et cetera, et cetera. So imagine this is the amino acid chain, the polypeptide chain we were supposed to get. Well, if let's say we had a mutation in this DNA sequence so that we had what's called um, an insertion mutation. So we got uh, C, C, so this was supposed to be CTC, and let's say, oh, I'm sorry, it's a substitution. Let's say we get CTT, so the C turned into a T here. Um, well, if you look at the genetic code, that's okay because the mRNA sequence that came from that would be AAG, and if you look on the genetic code, it would have still coded for glutamate, so it would have been the same amino acid. So that's what's called a synonymous or a silent point mutation. It does not change the amino acid, it's not going to have a negative or a positive effect on the organism. It's neutral. You still get what you're supposed to get. But if you get what's called a transition mutation, um, so let's see, let's look after this T here. We were supposed to get CAA, and instead we got CAG. So in other words, that second A turned into a G. Well, you might remember that guanine and adenine are both in the category of purines whereas um, the other two, the T and the C, are pyrimidines. When you get a purine to a purine, the amino acid in this case has changed. So instead of leucine, we got serine. Um, and it's usually not quite as bad as, as the next case where you go from a purine to a pyrimidine or vice versa, um, because size-wise, all purines are, are similar in size, whereas the pyrimidines are very opposite in size. Um, and so anyway, we get serine here. It probably is going to have a consequence for the organism because we've gotten a different amino acid, a different shape. Uh, down here, this is a transversion mutation where instead of, so we have TC, here we had TCA, here we have TCC. So instead of an adenine, we got a cytosine. So we went from a purine to a pyrimidine and that changed the amino acid from leucine to valine. So very different sized um, protein that you're going to get here. So that's another type of mutation. That's called a transversion mutation. The ones that usually are really bad are things like this, where, um, let's see, we were supposed to get GCC, or sorry, GCTC. Here we got GC, and then an insertion of a C before you get to that T. Well, the first amino acid's fine. Nothing happens to it. But now instead of the second um, set of bases being CTC, we now have CCT. Uh, so the second amino acid is glycine instead of glutamate. But then you've also thrown off the third codon. So we had CCG, 
Now we have CCT. And now we have CGT, which is alanine, whereas our third amino acid here would have been um, GLN here. And, and then that throws off everything else. So by putting an insertion, a, a base in there that wasn't supposed to be there, every three bases is now thrown off. And that's called a frame shift mutation. We've shifted everything over. And therefore, it's possible that every amino acid downstream from that, that insertion could be the wrong amino acid usually very bad for the organism. That gives you a completely different protein than what you needed. Um, and finally, worst of all, is when you get some kind of mutation, point mutation, that leads to coding for a stop codon. So as you can see here, so CCG, CTC, so so far so good, but now we were supposed to get a guanine and instead we got an adenine. Well, when you do the mRNA sequence, ATC, you're going to get UAG. If you look at the genetic code, UAG is a stop codon. And when you get a stop codon, boom, the whole process stops. You don't get the protein you're supposed to get. And if that was a vital protein for survival, that's deleterious for the organism. But again, with all of these mutations, if you can escape the ill effects, if it happens having that different kind of protein, if that gives you a selective advantage over others, you will survive and reproduce and pass on your these mutation genes to the population. And over time, that population um, experiences an increase in the frequency of the genes or the proteins that contain these mutations. That's evolution by definition. We also talked about chromosomal mutations. So imagine this is a, a chromosome right here. And remember that this is a lot of DNA packed into a small space. So uh, we've labeled different sections on this chromosome with letters, A, B, C, D, E, F. But remember that each letter here represents um, one or more genes, so sections of DNA. And during um, chromosomal replication or all sorts of conditions, you can actually get breakage in this chromosome. And so you're breaking large sections of DNA, multiple genes. So here, here's a picture of human chromosomes in their duplicated state. So with chromosomal mutations, you're actually getting breaks and all sorts of things happening to the physical structure of the chromosome. So for example, you might get a break here and here. Well, now these genes are by themselves um, and therefore probably won't get coded. But let's say we broke it here and here and the B part of the chromosome got deleted. Well, now if these guys came back together, you have A, C, D, E, F. You have a different sequence of genes here than what you were supposed to get. Or let's say the break occurred right here and right here. Well, um, now let's say these guys ended up inverting. So this would be called an inversion mutation, chromosomal mutation. So now if this little segment actually flips, and this happens, it's crazy, isn't it? It happens. And then these guys come back together, and now you have the gene sequences A, B, E, D, C instead of A, B, C, D, E. Well, now you're going to get a different order of protein synthesis going, and that can be bad, or in the case of evolutionary time, perhaps good for the organism. Uh, you can get duplication events where you got the break here, and that B segment actually replicated itself. Um, this is often not good for an organism because you get what's called upregulation, where you have duplicated genes now, and that gene duplication can cause too much of a particular protein to be manufactured. And that could be bad for an organism. Again, sometimes maybe that actually creates a phenotype that makes them more successful for that environment, in which case it's good and will be passed down. And this one's crazy. This is called jumping genes or translocation. And this is where you have, say, two chromosomes here. Um, a, B, C, D, E are the genes on this one. And you know, N, O, P, Q, R are the genes on this other chromosome in the genome. Imagine that these guys actually swap genes. So let's say the O and the N break off, oops, break off and switch over here, and the D and the E switch and break off and insert on that other chromosome. Now you're getting these genes literally jumping to other chromosomes in the, in the genome, and that can uh, create all sorts of havoc because you're not getting the manufacturing of the proteins that you need. Anyway, bottom line is crazy stuff happens in the assembly of DNA and proteins. All sorts of crazy stuff at the DNA level or at the chromosome level can happen. But ultimately, this creates the raw new material we need for evolution to act on.
Okay, so we've talked about natural and artificial selection and cumulative selection and mutation. Now we're going to go to another um, force in evolution. This is called genetic drift. And it, the definition is more confusing than the principle in this case. So genetic drift is defined as random chance change in allele frequencies over generation. And again, the keyword here is random chance change. Um, this would be, uh, there's two ways really that this occurs, um, but the key to it is it's change in gene frequencies, so it's evolution due to inbreeding in populations. And um, often this is a, a problem for small populations. So for conservation biologists, they're very, very concerned with genetic drift. They want to make sure they have a large enough population to prevent inbreeding. Because when you get inbreeding, organisms lose their viability. Their, um, their immune systems don't work as well. They're more prone to, therefore, to diseases. Their reproductive abilities are not as good. Um, so in examples with the cute cuddly cheetahs here, uh, these guys um, experience severe genetic drift. Um, specifically, they experience a kind of genetic drift called a genetic bottleneck. Because, uh, you know, a long time ago, they had a large diverse, genetically diverse population, you know, in the wild. Um, due to poaching and habitat destruction, their population went from very large to just a few individuals. And those few individuals were forced to breed with each other. And over time, there was intensive inbreeding as a result, you know, cousins mating with cousins and in extreme cases, sisters and brothers and parents and offspring. Um, and so their genetic viability went way down. But from an evolutionary point of view, what you're doing is you're taking lots of genes that are available in the population, a lot of genetic diversity, a lot of heterozygosity, you know, where you have dominant and recessive alleles both represented, suddenly slicing that population into a small population, and then when they come out, everybody carries the same sets of alleles. So, um, so we can uh, take an illustration of this, and again, this is significant for small populations, leads to what's called the fixation of alleles, where either everybody has that particular allele in the population or everybody in the population doesn't have it. So you see an example here. Let's say this is the frequency of a dominant allele, A. Let's say you start off um, in the population where half the population has the dominant allele A and half has the recessive allele. Well, if you experience genetic drift, um, either it goes to fixation where everybody in that population over successive generations, this would be like 20 generations, everybody carries only that allele. So everybody's homozygous dominant. Or that allele is lost to the population due to inbreeding and after some generations, everybody in the population does not have the dominant allele. So they are homozygous recessive in that case. So it leads to what's called the fixation of alleles. Um, so there's different ways this can happen. I mentioned genetic bottleneck. We're going to talk about that. And uh, there's also something called the founder effect. And both of these are kind of chance things that happen and both lead to um, reduction in genetic diversity and overall um, less likelihood that that population is going to be able to survive into the future because environments change and if everybody is the same you don't have that raw material that genetic diversity for any individuals to be better adapted to that environment and so you can get extinction of that entire population very very quickly and this is what happens with so many endangered species which is why conservationists are so worried about making sure you have large enough populations and enough genetic diversity to buffer against um, environmental change over time so even in the case of zoos, um, you know, these poor cheetahs, you know, the males um, in many cases have 70% um, uh, bad sperm. Either the sperm are dead or they're, they're deformed. Um, they have all sorts of, they're prone to all sorts of um, diseases because their immune systems are so low. So a lot of zoo conservation programs are trying to kind of swap cheetahs between zoos um, and so that you're bringing in some new genes into the populations. Okay, so two ways this happens, genetic bottleneck and the founder effect. So let's talk about genetic drift a little bit. So, you know, if you live in an area or you've ever visited an area where there's a lot of traffic on the highways, you might notice a traffic bottleneck, right? The cars are coming in onto the highway and then you're stuck and you're moving really, really slowly and then suddenly it opens up again and you're, you're good to go. So that's kind of what's happening here except with genes. So if you look at uh, this diagram, Kind of illustrate this. Imagine this was the population of cheetahs in the beginning, 
and each color represents a different allele. Um, and so you can see you had a nice genetically diverse population where, you know, every, you had a lot of heterozygotes there, you know, a lot of, if you're a heterozygote, you're diverse because you carry both a dominant allele and a recessive allele. Now here comes poaching and habitat destruction, and now most of these individuals die off, very few are able to squeak through, but now because there's so few individuals, less um, of the diversity of phenotypes is represented. And so these guys, like you can see here, the only ones that squeaked through was whatever is represented here. Maybe that's the recessive allele, and maybe in blue here represents the dominant allele. These guys are forced to breed with each other, and now as the population grows again, you've lost that diversity. Like where did this other allele go to? You know, so you've lost that from the population. So everybody becomes more inbred, less genetically diverse. So population dwindles to a few individuals, they're forced to inbreed, so you get massive inbreeding, and uh, the ultimate um, the ultimate uh, result is a less diverse population. And uh, we all know that you know it's not good to inbreed. So um, even in humans, you can see where small populations where there was a lot of inbreeding, you get what's uh, called um, unmasking of deleterious recessive alleles. So every single one of us has bad genes. We may not know it because we may appear fine and act fine, but, you know, we can have recessive bad alleles that are masked by the dominant alleles of heterozygotes. Well, when you get two cousins together that are both heterozygous, they come together and suddenly you can unmask those bad recessive alleles because you've created offspring that are homozygous recessive and they express the trait. So we talked about sickle cell. We said that if you have a male and female that are heterozygous for sickle cell and therefore they are considered fit because they don't get malaria or sickle cell, but when they breed together, a quarter of those babies will be homozygous recessive for sickle cell, and that baby will experience sickle cell anemia. So, um, so that's an example. When you get genetic drift and you get a small population, you unmask these bad recessive alleles. Um, so uh, this can happen from random chance events. So let's take an example of Mount St. Helens. You know, 1980, it erupted in Washington State. So suddenly this mountain, turns out it was a volcano, boom, it um, starts spewing lava everywhere. And all of a sudden, you know, half the mountain is dead. It's covered with lava. So you've lost, if you had a species of, could be anything, a flower, or a bird, or whatever it is. Let's say we take a species of flower. Well, suddenly half of all the individuals of that population are gone because they got covered with lava. You're now reduced to the half of the population that was on the other side of the mountain. And so as these guys breed and start the next generation, you're only getting gene representation from that part of the, the mountain. You lost all the genetic diversity that was on the other side. So that was a chance random mutation. You know, nobody called for the eruption of the mountain, but it was a chance event and it resulted in changes in allele frequencies in that population over time evolution, right? So that's why genetic drift is a mechanism of evolution. So it's often caused due to some kinds of catastrophes, it could be hunting, it could be habitat loss, hurricanes, whatever it is, these are chance events that end up affecting evolution. Because if we keep in mind the definition of evolution, changes in allele frequencies in a population over time. So another way that we can get genetic drift, a random event, is due to the founder effect. Um, and you often hear in human populations an example given with the Amish. So the Amish live in places like Pennsylvania, Ohio, and um, they came over from uh, Europe ultimately. And anytime you're taking a mainland population, which is genetically diverse, has a lot of different genes, and you take a subset of that population and take them into a new area, well, you now have a smaller population that is forced to inbreed with itself, and therefore you get a representation of genes in that founder population that might have been a different frequency than those genes were represented in the mainland population. So as an example, if you take uh, the Amish, they came over from Europe, and their original population in Europe was perhaps like this. If each color represents a different um, frequency of gene or a different phenotype, you know, maybe you had a nice, diverse um, population of genes, but let's say the individuals represented, um, or the genes represented in green and white and light blue here were the ones that left Europe and went to North America. And now they breed with each other, and so 
you can see that the population's frequency of the genes represented by these colors are way more overrepresented than they were in the original mainland population. And the, for example, the gene illustrated in pink here becomes way less represented than it was in the original population. So it's not that there was any consciousness to, um, to changing this gene frequency. It was by chance. It was a chance event that part of the population migrated and therefore the frequency of the genes changes in that population compared to the original population. So uh, in the Amish, for example, it's actually very common for individuals to be polydactyl. That means to have multiple like six fingers and toes um, or fingers or toes. And so that gene that causes polydactyly is very common in the Amish population, but was very rare in the mainland population that they came from. So that's what we uh, mean by um, the founder effect. So that's one condition of genetic drift. Uh, here's another example. This one's kind of neat. This happened on an island in the Caribbean called Tristan da Cunha. And this um, island was founded by uh, just a few families from Scotland. And so um, I believe it was about eight families from Scotland had migrated to Tristan da Cunha because they were a small population. There was a lot of inbreeding going on. And uh, suddenly a big hurricane was going to come. And so um, the governments of Scotland and Europe um, in Europe and America decided to evacuate this island because of the hurricane. And they brought these people back to their homeland and did some genetic analyses on them. And what they found was that that population on Tristan da Cunha, it was very, very common for them to carry an allele that caused uh, retinal problems with their eyes. So most of the people on the island had that gene. Whereas the original population that they immigrated, emigrated from in Scotland, only 1% of the population had that gene. So that's an example of the founder effect. The gene that had been very rare for this retinal problem becomes the norm in this founding island, in this new area, because of that few individuals coming over and starting the new population. So again, changes in allele frequencies in the population over time, that's evolution. So this is evolution that we've seen in humans. Okay, so we've talked about natural selection, artificial selection, cumulative selection, and mutation, and genetic drift, and now we're going to talk about gene flow. So gene flow, in a nutshell, is migration. And there's two ways you can get migration. You can get immigration, where individuals come into an area, and you can get emigration where individuals leave that area. Well, either way, uh, if you have individuals coming into an area, you're likely going to be bringing new genes, new alleles into that population. And those individuals that immigrated in are going to mate with native individuals. And therefore, the gene frequencies of that population over time are going to change because now you bring new genes in. You're introducing new stuff um, for evolution to act on in that population. Emigration would be the opposite. You'd actually get genes, you're losing genes from that population. And, uh, and so that can actually make individuals more similar. So emigration is causing the loss of alleles in the population, whereas immigration is causing new alleles to come in and therefore increases genetic variation in the short term uh, in that population. So you have an example here of these little beetles and there are different colors here, so they represent the possession of different genes. So if this uh, beetle from this population emigrates um, from this population and immigrates into this population, it'll eventually breed with individuals native to the population and thus introduce this light colored gene where it what didn't exist before. So that's increasing genetic diversity. Uh, if it happened the other way where, uh, where a green one was coming into this population, you would have been introducing new genes into this population. But this guy has taken some of the genes that were here and taken them away through emigration. So in the short term, immigration is going to cause the increase of, of alleles and emigration causes the loss. But over the long run, if this continues long enough, eventually you start reducing genetic diversity between the populations because you start shuffling the same genes back and forth and back and forth. So an example of this is with this uh, blue jay here. He likes to eat acorns and, and carry acorns around. And so they've, for example, documented where you can have uh, different populations of oak trees 
And these blue jays will start taking acorns from one patch and dropping it in another patch, and that becomes trees, and taking acorns from this patch and dropping them in that patch, which grow into trees. And so you're actually, in terms of the oak tree genetics, you're shuffling those oak tree genes back and forth. And given enough time, you actually make, you know, a long-term time, you actually make those two patches genetically identical to each other. Crazy, huh? But either way, we're changing the frequencies of alleles in the population due to gene flow, emigration and emigration. So another mechanism of evolution. And finally, the last mechanism I want to talk about, uh, I call this the Jerry Springer form of evolution because um, this is called assortative mating. And this is where you're changing the allele frequencies in a population over time because of who you're choosing as a mate. So uh, we're choosing mates based on heritable variation. A heritable trait. So uh, this is, these guys say, uh, this is the ugliest blind date I've ever seen. This is an illustration of a kind of assortative mating. So there's two kinds. We have positive assortative mating and we have negative assortative mating. So in positive assortative mating, it means that you're choosing to mate with an individual that shares the same alleles that you do, or at least for some traits. So in other words, uh, let's say you're tall. You decide you're going to mate with someone who's tall, well, guess what? That's a form of inbreeding because you guys both contain genes for being tall. Or if you have hitchhiker's thumb and you purposely mate with someone who has hitchhiker's thumb, or even if you don't do it on purpose, you just happen to mate with someone who has hitchhiker's thumb, that's a form of inbreeding because you guys share the same gene, the same DNA sequence for thumb. And, um, and so this is a form of inbreeding, and when it's done very severely, because you're meeting with cousins or whatever, you're unmasking tons of deleterious recessive alleles, and you get um, a overall lowered uh, vigor, lowered um, viability of the organism, and that's called inbreeding depression. So, um, you know, if you like tall, dark, and handsome, and you are tall, dark, and handsome, you will have babies that are tall, dark, and handsome. And if everybody is looking for tall, dark, and handsome, pretty soon you have a population of tall, dark, and handsome individuals. But let's say uh, you're tall, dark, and handsome, and you want to um, mate with short, stocky, and ugly. Well, you, in that case, you're doing uh, what's called negative assortative mating, where you're mating with individuals with the opposite traits from you, which is, um, in other words, you're creating um, the opposite genes in the offspring than what you have. So that's the opposite of inbreeding. Um, if it goes on too extreme, you can actually get what's called outbreeding depression because organisms might be less adapted to their environment because there's not enough inbreeding going on. So there has to be a balance there. But again, negative assortative mating, you're mating with individuals with the different alleles than yourself. So in other words, if I have the gene for hitchhiker's thumb, I'd be mating with a gene, or with someone with the gene for straight thumb. Those are the opposite genes. And so that's how we get heterozygous individuals. Um, we get, our babies might be heterozygous for thumb. So by creating those heterozygous babies, you're creating genetic diversity in the population. Given enough time, you have more and more genetic diversity in the population. That's evolution towards greater diversity. Too much positive assortative mating, more individuals share the same alleles with each other. They, there's more homozygotes. And so over time, you're getting greater inbreeding and less genetic diversity in the population. But um, all of this might have a reason. So for example, um, in cute little golden lion tamarind monkeys, these little orange little monkeys, uh, they're endangered in, in Brazil. And uh, they live in little family groups. And when the sons get to be teenagers, their parents kick them out of the house, kick them out of the troop. Sound familiar? And they are forced to try to gain admittance into another family troop um, so that they can find a mate. Um, and this, they believe, helps to avoid inbreeding within a population. But again, assortative mating, picking individuals to mate with that, uh, because of certain heritable traits they have. If they say or share the same traits as you, that's positive assortative mating. If they share negative traits as, as you, that's negative assortative mating. And again, all of this becomes one of those mechanisms of evolution because it causes changes in allele frequencies in a population over time. By definition, that's evolution. Okay, so quick summary. What are the different ways evolutionary change can happen? Selection, right? Natural selection, artificial selection, whatever kind of selection you want, it's still selecting for individuals that have particular traits 
different from everybody else that allows them to survive, reproduce, and pass those genes on to the next generation. And we talked about different kinds of selection, directional, stabilizing, um, or disruptive selection, or situations where there's no selection at all. And we talked about cumulative selection as being an illustration of that. We talked about the different ways mutation happens, and that generates the new raw genetic material that evolution can act on. We talked about genetic drift, where we get random chance um, environmental things happening that cause changes in allele frequencies in the population over time. And two cases of that genetic drift, um, uh, two cases of genetic drift are genetic bottleneck and the founder effect. Then we talked about gene flow, which is migration, immigration, emigration, causing the introduction of new genes to come into a population or some genes to leave. And finally, assortative mating, where you're choosing a mate based on their heritable traits. Now, the question is, can all of these little microevolutionary changes lead to big macroevolutionary changes like the production of new species and genuses and, and family groups and orders and etc.? Well, all the evidence points to yes, and in the next video, we're going to talk about some of the evidence for macroevolutionary change, and uh, some of those are really cool to study, like um, things like vestigial and atavistic structures, and we're going to play the find the human game. So stay tuned. Take care.